We're on part three now of the blood, and we're on page 634. And we just took a look at the red blood cell and erythrocyte here. It's the structure of it. Okay, then um, we sort of continue on to uh, what's unique about it. It's uh, relatively small compared to the other cells. It's biconcave, an important detail. Um, it's actually packed with hemoglobin, the, um, the thing that it's uh, going to be using to um, transfer uh, oxygen molecules. So that's an important detail. Um, and it's, uh, it says discounting water content, all erythrocytes, all, uh, an erythrocyte is over 97% hemoglobin, so that's pretty packed with hemoglobin. And then um, it says over here on the next page, 635, uh, because erythrocytes um, lack mitochondria and um, they generate ATP exclusively by anaerobic mechanisms of uh, metabolizing glucose and uh, ketones and so on, that uh, they don't actually utilize the oxygen that they're carrying. So they're very efficient in that regard. And... Uh, we're talking now about hemoglobin. Hemoglobin is a big um, protein molecule. It's actually a four-part molecule. There are four different uh, proteins uh, that have a primary structure, the sequence of amino acids that has some secondary structure like helices right here. It has tertiary structure, which is to say it, it bends, and there are um, little... Um, aspects here of the uh, amino acid sequence, some of which are acid and uh, negatively charged, some are positively charged, and so they they bend toward each other if they have opposite charges and they have this tertiary structure. In addition to the tertiary structure, they have quaternary structure, so that means that weak forces will hold these four globular proteins together in this very specific shape. There is some allostery, that is to say, there is some shape-shifting when um, these little porphyrin rings here with the iron, I don't know why they make iron green at the middle, but at any rate, they do. Um, <laughs> this is a porphyrin ring. It's a very specifically shaped ring. Here it is now. Um, it's got all this resonance structure to it. It's a very colorful thing because of the resonance structure. Whenever a photon comes in here, it takes a little um, circuit around the racetrack here. And since the circuit with an iron in it uh, is approximately 700 nanometers, it has a red color. If this was magnesium and uh, in a porphyrin ring, it would be a green color and it would be a part of chlorophyll. So as it turns out, uh, if you're really interested in fabulous protein and you're, um, you're a vampire, um, you can actually how shall I say, um, substitute uh, green, uh, chlorophyll-filled leaves, for instance, uh, in place of your, um, your blood diet. So just a thought to keep in mind um, in case you want to change your diet for some reason or another. Um, that's the deal right there. So um, here, let's take a look again at the position of these uh, porphyrin rings. It turns out that we actually have... Um, Notice here very carefully in the small text, small, small font, we have an alpha globulin, um, and there's two of them, alpha 1, alpha 2. And the bigger, there's bigger uh, globular proteins here on top. This is the beta globular, beta globulins 1 and 2. So two alphas and two betas. If there's anything wrong with the sequence here, if there's a mutation or some sort of defect in the system, then um, we have a condition called thalassemia in which sometimes there are defects. Then we say that it's, a, it's an alpha thalassemia or a beta thalassemia. Uh, but basically, these are like little pockets where oxygen molecules slip in without, without actually uh, covalently bonding. These are weak bonds. The oxygen just slips in there, one, two, three, four spots, so one hemoglobin molecule will carry four oxygens. You need to remember that the rest of your life. Okay, so that'll get you through all the board exams and stuff like that. Um, 
let's take a look here at um, their making all sorts of interesting comments here in the text. You can read about that. I've more or less covered all those points up until this one here. So um, let's see here. Transporting gases is what this, uh, we're on page 635 now, and um, 635, right? And um, we're taking a look here at oxygen loading. So that's, that's uh, a little detail here that I'm trying to get out of the... Uh, reflection of that light. So uh, when oxygen loads on to the hemoglobin, it actually changes shape a little bit, sort of like when your pockets get full. And uh, we call that condition oxyhemoglobin. And then when we get to a place where we get to the cells where we offload the oxygen, then again the, em the pockets empty, a different shape results, and we call that deoxyhemoglobin. So the actual shape and physical structure of the hemoglobin molecule actually matters. Um, and once you get the first oxygen loaded on, uh, actually the pockets open up a little bit and it's easier to get number two, three, and four on. And the same thing uh, with offloading, there is a sequence in which there is a change of shape. So you pull the first one out and then the two, three, and four uh, proceed smoothly. Okay, so then we have this other thing called uh, carbamino uh, hemoglobin, which is to say once you've emptied off your um, hemoglobin uh, wherever you're delivering there, then you have an empty hemoglobin and you can take on a couple of uh, CO2s. Uh, CO2 does not fit as well onto the um, hemoglobin molecule, so it's a, it's a less efficient carrier device. But the good news, uh, most of um, the uh, carbon dioxide is going to be uh, traveling as uh, bicarbonate, HCO3 minus 1. So that's, uh, that's good news. Okay, we have a stem cell here. This is the stem cell for all uh, blood cells, not just the red blood cell. But um, if we were in graduate school, I would be making you learn the names of all these and be able to identify their differences. Okay, so lucky you. Here's the pycnotic state. Here's the state where we lose the nucleus. Here's the resulting uh, cell, and then we, um, we basically mature the cell to the point where it has all this hemoglobin. It's just nothing but a cell filled with hemoglobin for the most part. And uh, whatever else is going on with the cell, it functions on um, anaerobically derived ATP. So that's our deal right there. Um, there is one little detail that's good to know um, that... Um, the regulation and requirements for erythrocyte uh, production here is being discussed and one of the things that we're noticing is that there's a hormonal control and that um, the, um, the deal with uh, the hormone is at the kidney level. There's a portion of the kidney in the cortex that has cells that look at the uh, uh, afferent and efferent arterioles coming in and they can determine whether or not uh, there is a, um, blood, uh, a blood oxygen challenge going on. So if you move to a higher altitude or if you uh, start a new aerobic sport like soccer uh, or tennis and, or if you um, uh, get a job uh, that requires you to maybe um, become a bike messenger or something and you need to start to exert a lot of energy, um, then EPO will go out and your um, red blood cell count will go up, uh, your hematocrit, as it were. So that's the hematocrit is the percentage of blood uh, that is made out of red blood cells, erythrocytes. That's what it specifically means. And your hematocrit, if it needs to go up, or if you're challenged in any way by oxygen needs, then you need to have uh, EPO released from the kidney, and it goes to the, um, to the uh, stem cells at the uh, bone marrow. Okay, then, um, so then uh, blood oxygen um, is uh, represented right here in the bone marrow and the kidney. And um, so we're trying to balance everything. And um, the deal is, is if we don't have enough oxygen, there's a stimulus, uh, the oxygen levels go down, the kidney gets uh, stimulated 
by the lack of oxygen or the need for more, it sends EPO to the bone marrow. The bone marrow makes more blood. It makes all kinds of blood, but it mainly focuses on red blood cells as a clonal expansion, and then we, we get enough oxygen capacity, oxygen carrying capacity. Okay, so then um, uh, there are a number of things it, it says here, the, the drop in uh, normal uh, blood oxygen levels is what uh, stimulates this. There could be a reduced number of red blood cells, and so we need more. Why would that be? Is because you gave blood, a pint of blood, or maybe there was some bleeding uh, that went on. You had a cut. Um, insufficient hemoglobin, um, for whatever reason, uh, would stimulate the increase in RBC production. Uh, reduced availability of oxygen, uh, so that means moving to a higher um, uh, altitude or in the case of pneumonia, there could be uh, a struggle for oxygen. Okay, they talk about dietary requirements and of course this is the only area pretty much where iron plays a role and iron ultimately is toxic to the body and um, it's one of the reasons it's thought that women actually have better heart health than men uh, during childbearing years between puberty and menopause is because they they bleed once a month um, and that the blood loss actually recirculates and re rejuvenates and renews the blood supply. The reason for this all is uh, that iron is toxic, extremely toxic, and uh, so it needs to be wrapped up in the liver uh, with protein and it's then uh, carried by protein. Ferritin is a sort of a ferry, right? Uh, like moving things around across a river or something like that, ferritin. And then um, there's this other one called uh, hemosiderin. Okay, so these are two uh, molecules uh, for storing uh, iron. Ferritin and hemosiderin are molecules in the liver, whereas uh, transferrin is a molecule found in the intestines. Whenever you have to go from the um, storage aspect to the uh, moving aspect, you have to uh, switch to transferrin. Uh, 